Great. Thanks so much, Paige. Hi, everybody. I'm Will Barrett. I am the Director of Clean Air Advocacy for the American Lung Association. I'm based in Sacramento, California, and happy to have the opportunity to speak with everyone today. Uh, the main things that I'm going to cover are really uh, sharing the impacts of climate change on our ongoing work to provide clean, healthy air to all communities across the country. Um, we've made tremendous progress in cleaning up the air over the 50-year history of the Clean Air Act. And um, unfortunately, we're seeing the, the signs that climate change is making the job of cleaning up the air that much more difficult. And ultimately, wildfires are a very visible example of this growing challenge. So we'll jump right in. Um, the image you're seeing now really spotlights many of the respiratory health risks associated with climate change. Uh, climate change is ultimately a, a threat amplifier for many of our most vulnerable populations. We see impacts ranging from increased uh, heat-related health impacts, worsening air and, and water quality, greater stressors on people with asthma and allergies, and a wide range of other health impacts. Um, today, we'll be focused on wildfire impacts and have some great speakers uh, on the panel today to, to share their work and hopefully uh, give everyone a good sense of uh, ways that we can all work together. Uh, next slide. Um, really, again, showing a range of the uh, health impacts associated with more extreme uh, climate conditions, uh, again, making our job of cleaning the air that much more difficult. The Lung Association's annual State of the Air report um, every year puts out, uh, we put out this report highlighting the levels of ozone or summertime smog or particle pollution um, across every county in the United States that has air quality monitors really uh, trying to show the impacts and benefits of the actions we're taking to clean up the air. Last year's report, the 2019 report, covered uh, this data um, for the years 2015 through 2017. And within my work uh, here in California, I'll just highlight some of what we saw in that report. Um, 2015, 2016, and 2017 represent the three hottest years globally on record. Uh, we also, in California, saw seven of the 20 most destructive wildfires in state history. Um, so for uh, both of those conditions really added to the challenges of, of clean, healthy air for all communities. Um, for ozone, the, again, the summertime smog, we saw increased ozone pollution in 23 California counties um, compared to the prior report. And for particle pollution, we saw 32 counties with increases as a result of um, the conditions related to the wildfires in those years. Um, going back to the prior reports, we actually even saw uh, when California was going through the historic drought, we saw 25 counties one year with increased particle pollution as a result of those conditions. So now 2020, California is entering back into drought watch, unfortunately. Um, our 2020 report, we're going to highlight the, the catastrophic wildfire in 2018, the Camp Fire. In Northern California, that was the deadliest fire in state history. So again, just really highlighting the fact that uh, wildfires, climate change, um, other climate-related impacts are, are causing it, causing our air quality challenges uh, to be that much more prominent. Um, within the wildfire section specifically, um, higher temperatures and drought are increasing the frequency, severity, and uh, length of our fire season in California and throughout the West. Uh, wildfire smoke can increase pollution levels even thousands of miles away. We've seen uh, reports of wildfires from Western United States, Western Canada, spreading across the entire United States, unfortunately. Um, and the impacts of fine particle pollution are well known. I'll, I'll touch on that in, a, in the next slide. But we're also note, noting that um, wildfire um, smoke can, can impact the levels of ozone too, especially when we have fires in the summer months when the, the weather is hotter, as we've seen in the last several years in California. Um, on the next slide, we'll talk about the health effects uh, that we're most concerned about with wildfires uh, related to smoke. Um, essentially, fine particle pollution um, can bypass the body's defenses, can be inhaled deeply into the lungs and even cross over into the bloodstream, creating um, significant health emergencies for people living with respiratory conditions, cardiovascular conditions, and, and a wide range of other health impacts. This can result in the need for greater medication uh, usage, reliance on medication, uh, more contact or visits with physicians, uh, medical professionals, uh, trips to the emergency room, or even hospitalizations. Um, 
There's also the, the challenge of um, evacuation from homes um, when people are uprooted very rapidly in most cases with the wildfires um, really puts a strain on health healthcare, um, you know, maintaining regiments of medication, access to uh, healthcare providers, certainly in Northern California, um, issues where uh, hospitals are uh, evacuated. We've seen uh, clinics actually destroyed in Northern California during wildfire events and pharmacies having to close. So, I mean, there's a wide range of access to healthcare on top of the respiratory and cardiovascular impacts of wildfire smoke. Um, there's also a growing issue related to, um, in California, uh, looking at the, the shutdown of power to prevent these catastrophic wildfires when wind events might knock down uh, power lines. And that creates a whole other host of, of challenges when um, power is put out or cut off for, for a week at a time, for example, as we saw this year. Um, and that puts a strain on people whose medications are, need to be stored in the refrigerator or um, people are on oxygen and other home health equipment uh, that requires power. So that, that creates an additional level of challenge and the utilities really need to work um, to make sure that those, those people with health conditions are, are, are most you know, paid attention to in those situations. Um, on the next slide, we will go to, um, really this is getting into the response that we've seen in California and throughout the Western US um, due to the wildfires and really looking at, um, a lot of it comes down to public education. We have, um, during the wildfire events, people need to take precautions to protect their health, whether that's people in the immediate vicinity of the, the wildfires and need to evacuate and, and take precautions or people well downwind. And so that, that comes down to um, protection during wildfire exposure events, um, certainly protection during cleanup events. Many of the wildfires that we've seen in California and throughout the West have, have actually been at the kind of urban rural interface. So communities going, uh, being burned up and consumed in the fires, leaving behind a, a mix of ash and, uh, and other chemicals that are left behind when homes and cars and buildings and other structures are burned down. And all of those consumer products, electronics, everything else gets burned up with them. Um, and that leaves behind chemicals that we certainly want to protect people from. So again, public health messaging has, has been really ramping up as a result of the increased fires and smoke awareness. Um, we also know that um, there are, you know, one of the key things we tell people is to stay indoors um, in a well um, ventilated, well, you know, protected place so that indoor air quality is protected. Ultimately, uh, that isn't available to everybody. Uh, there are people uh, with, um, substandard housing, there are people who are homeless or others who don't have access to clean indoor air um, in general. And so there's a, a growing awareness that we need to really focus on indoor air quality shelters or wildfire smoke shelters uh, that can be accessible to our most vulnerable populations who don't have uh, ready access to clean indoor air. Uh, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District led an effort last year that resulted in a new state law to generate grant funding um, to retrofit public spaces, so um, schools, gymnasiums, things like that, where people can have access to clean, healthy air through a, a well-filtered uh, ventilation system. So that's moving forward, and it's something that I think will, will have a, a real impact on protecting the public during wildfire events. Um, the, the last thing I'll touch on is uh, throughout the West, uh, the Western U.S., there's more investment in resources and programs to prevent uh, these catastrophic wildfires or attempt to uh, through the use of uh, reducing fuel. So that could be prescribed fires and other methods um, to speeding response to incidences through greater monitoring and, and response times, and then hardening the key infrastructure that um, in many cases has been um, impacted by the wildfires, whether that's our power systems or roads and other things, um, really making sure that uh, we can build resilience and uh, preventative measures uh, for wildfire. Um, but we also know that uh, throughout all of these, through the public education, through the wildfire smoke shelters, through um, new smoke management programs and other things, uh, we know that there's a really important, strong need for clear, concise, consistent messaging from public agencies and um, making sure that the data is available to the public in a way that they can easily um, appreciate and take action to protect their health. So um, that's just a quick run through of some of the, the responses to wildfires. 
um, and some of the impacts that we've seen uh, from a lung health perspective. So with that, I'll, I'll end there and turn it back over for our next speaker. And again, thank you for having us uh, participate today. Well, um, thanks, Will, for kicking us off. And we're really excited to be connecting with um, the American Lung Association. My name is Tracy Holloway, and um, I'm the director of the NASA Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences team. And a lot of the work uh, of our team has been trying to connect NASA data with social, health, regulatory, and environmental challenges where satellite data could inform uh, and, and support decision making. And we've been um, a NASA team now for about uh, four years. And our website is uh, highlighted here. The URL is um, haycast.org. But I'm just going to tee up a little bit to kind of give you the, the NASA perspective on a few resources that could be helpful with wildfire assessment. And um, uh, my colleague, uh, Yang Lu, will go more into depth about how specific satellite products can connect with um, ground level particulate matter associated with wildfire events and others. But if you haven't been to our website, I would really invite you uh, to do so. And um, you can see at the top, we have um, the about people and then projects. And um, across our team, we have two different types of projects projects that are advanced by individual scientists and their teams, but also collaborative efforts that we call tiger teams. And actually one of the tiger teams has been explicitly focused on satellite data for wildland fires, and that has been um, led by Susan O'Neill. So if you go under the projects and look at tiger teams, you'll find a lot of different resources related to making satellite data more useful for um, wildfire assessment and uh, risk management and health assessment and retrospective and planning for uh, forecasts. Next slide, please. So um, you, the reason why HACAST is uh, running the series of webinars and why we're trying to connect um, the American Lung Association and health professionals with satellite data is that we were funded by NASA to do so. Um, it was um, for many years NASA has had science teams that funded research around a particular instrument. And HACAST is uh, a second generation uh, applied science team around air quality and health. And the goal is to try to connect users from a wide range of organizations, uh, regulatory, health, nonprofit, for profit, um, across the board with the resources of um, our existing Earth observing system. So sometimes I feel like I'm a salesperson trying to sell billions of dollars of data for free because NASA makes everything online free and publicly available. I'm not just, uh, it's not just me, of course. We have about 70 co-investigators as part of our team organized through 13 different research grants. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, that we have different types of projects that's going on, including um, outreach and engagement, and so I'd like to thank you all for um, joining us through this uh, webinar as well. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about the Earth Observing System of NASA, there are a constellation of satellites orbiting the Earth, and they're not, of course, all run by NASA. Many other countries also have um, satellites that provide data over North America, and just as many of NASA's satellites provide data uh, for other countries around the world. Uh, most satellites that detect air pollution uh, are polar orbiting, meaning that they cover the entire Earth, um, sometimes once a day, sometimes less than once a day. And depending on the characteristics of the instrument, the, um, the, view, the field of view may be narrow or may be wide. But one of the challenges in connecting satellite data with public health is the fact that satellites see the whole column of air from the surface all the way up to space. Um, so trying to figure out how much of the pollution that they're seeing is at the surface where people are breathing is one of the biggest challenges. And I know Yang will be talking a little about that in a few minutes. Next slide. One of the ways that I like thinking about the potential uses of satellite data is to compare it with how monitors uh, are already being used. 
And this slide was adapted from my colleague, Bart Sponseller from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. He used to uh, manage our monitoring network for the state. And he had this uh, five bullets of why we have ground level air monitors. And this is from a state regulatory perspective. It's a little different from a public health or a wildfire perspective, but I think it sort of lays out this idea that there are reasons we currently collect data. And in the case of the regulatory monitors, the number one reason is to assess compliance with federal standards. But other reasons include looking at trends, assessing what causes bad air pollution, evaluating models, providing information to the public. And actually, um, for all of those latter issues, a satellite data is very well suited for um, engagement. So I think one of the challenges we found through our HACAST um, projects is that there are some tasks that satellite data is not well suited for, but many that it is well suited for. And part of the research challenge is trying to match the right question with the right resources. And oftentimes uh, there may be a research question or an application that has never been tried before. And that's why this we have a lot of researchers um, as part of HACAST. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide. And just to um, bring you back to our website um, and also give thanks to Paige and Dagan who are making all of these nice webinars uh, possible. But um, if you've never used satellite data or if you've only used it a little bit, um, you might want to, um, we've been trying to make our website a uh, one-stop shop to help you get started. And under the tools and resources, the first option is um, getting started. And um, then three down, you have tools. And we have uh, ranked the tools from um, easy, but not very flexible, to more sophisticated, but then with more opportunities to customize them to do what you want. There's always a trade-off between uh, whether you can customize it to your specific application, but then it may be a little trickier to get started with. So we tried to make it as easy as possible. Um, we recommend that if you haven't used satellite data before, you check out NASA Worldview. That is probably the easiest and most intuitive interface for satellite data. And on our um, website, we have video tutorials and written tutorials and links on how to get there. So. Um, it's a good place to start, and I think once you start up, uh, getting familiar with satellite data, then it's a good jumping off point for uh, more sophisticated applications like um, Jan will be talking about now. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, for this opportunity, uh, I'm Yan Liu, a faculty member at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. Uh, today, I'd like to take this uh, opportunity to offer my thoughts on uh, the applications of satellite instruments and its data models to help with the uh, characterization of uh, PM 2.5 concentrations. So I, I, I was often asked by this question uh, that, well, in the U.S., you have a pretty comprehensive monitor, ground monitoring network with uh, over 1,200 monitors, right? Now, why satellites? Uh, if you look at this uh, U.S. network more closely, you realize, um, well, it's, it's not as dense as you think, right? Uh, the background of this slide shows you the, uh, the area in red that is actually not covered by the monitoring network. Uh, out of the roughly 3,100 Continental U.S. counties, only about 690 of them have more than one monitor. On average, each monitor covers about 180,000 people, or you know, roughly 1,800 square kilometers in these 690 counties. And about 80 million people living in rural and suburban areas are not covered at all. Uh, current uh, condition with EPA is that uh, it costs a lot of money to maintain this network, and the possibility of expanding this network is relatively small, especially expanding into potential areas that are affected and getting more and more affected by transient events, such as the storms and wildfires, is uh, that, that opportunity is not very uh, great. So 
the, the question is, can we do anything with satellite data and other tools to improve the situation? Uh, to, get, to get everybody on the same page, if you uh, uh, a toy version of how uh, satellite actually sees and or in our in our jargon uh, retrieves uh, particle information. And if you look at this very kind of a toy like uh, uh, schematic, you see before the uh, uh, well, first of all, satellites measure reflected sunlight when they try to characterize particles in the air. Right? Before the reflected sunlight or the information reaches the satellite, it undergoes multiple processes in the atmosphere. For example, when you have cloud cover, uh, the incoming solar radiation can be blocked and, and bounced back. So in that, in that situation, the satellite sees a, a block of missing area. Right? Uh, Incoming solar radiation can also interact with the land surface and be re uh, reflected or absorbed by the land surface. Then the uh, <clears throat> reflected solar radiation reaching the satellite contains both the signal of the land and the signal of the air. Now the incoming solar radiation can also interact with the atmosphere itself, you know, the, the gas species in the air through scattering and uh, absorption, and then be uh, observed by the satellite. And finally, the incoming solar radiation can interact with the particles in the air and then be observed by the satellite. Now, the cloud cover generates missing data. The surface reflectance or the surface signal is considered noise right, in the satellite signal overall. Uh, the gas extinction is also considered noise, but it's well characterized, and we can take that out relatively easily. So the satellite uh, aerosol remote sensing technology, uh, in a nutshell, is to separate the land signals from the atmospheric signals and take out the gas species signals. So what's left? is how particles inter in the air interact with solar radiation. And then we have mathematical tools to infer particle abundance in the air. So that's kind of a, a nutshell of how aerosol, uh, aerosol information abundance type and other uh, type of information is retrieved by satellites. Uh, as you can see on this slide, there are a few things, quite a few parameters that satellite can offer. Uh, the first one is most widely used. The, uh, it is the aerosol optical depth. Uh, we often use, it, uh, use the aerosol optical thickness interchangeably. Uh, you can, uh, sometimes in the equation, you see it as, as tau. Uh, several satellite sensors offer a parameter called phi mode fraction, uh, which aims at giving you a better characterization of the uh, smaller particles, or uh, to refer to the uh, ambient air quality monitoring standards, it would be PM 2.5. Uh, there are also kind of a specialty parameters that like, can retrieve, for example, Anstrom exponent or alpha, that's a measure of particle size. Single scattering albedo or omega, it's a measure of the darkness or blackness of particles, how much light individual particles can absorb. Uh, there are even more specialized uh, satellite parameters such as particle sphericity, whether this particle is round or as a group, it's pre predominantly made of round particles. Now, the importance of this parameter is that most uh, combustion generated particles after a certain time of aging are round or spherical. And then mechanically generated particles, such as dust uh, particles, are typically not you know, spherical. So to some extent, it gives you some information about the source of the particles. And then uh, uh, satellites can offer rough categorization of particle type. For example, uh, it can uh, roughly uh, tell if this aerosol air mass is made of a lot of dust particles. Right, or it's made of a lot of smoke particles. And then uh, spaceborne LIDARs uh, offer vertical extinction profile, or in other words, 
uh, where the aerosol layer is vertically. But the issue with the spaceborne laser is that its spatial coverage is very, very limited. Now, for us, I mean, like Tracy said, uh, the satellite sees, in general, sees the overall column, things in the overall column, which is from the surface to the top of the atmosphere. For satellites, for satellite parameters to be linked to surface level air quality indicators, there is a fundamental assumption that has to be met. And that is if most particles are concentrated and well mixed in the lower troposphere, typically we measure that as the uh, boundary layer or the mixing depth. Then aerosol uh, optical depth, for example, contains a strong signal of ground level particle concentration. Now, uh, to put it to put it in, in kind of in layperson terms, uh, the satellite measure needs to be correlated or of heavily influenced by the surface air pollution to begin with. Now, if we're looking at substantial long range transport events such as uh, you know large scale dust storms or long range transport of smoke, uh, these events will introduce errors and outliers in our uh, method for estimating surface concentration. Now, here uh, smoke events would mean for example, a large plume of uh, wildfire smoke from Alaska, right? Uh, a big wildfire smoke plume out of you know, Borneo or Sumatra, or a very large dust storm from the Gobi Desert or the Sahara Desert transporting across the, the ocean and then landing in, in the US, right? Uh, fortunately, most of the time, this uh, assumption of well mixed boundary layer is uh, is actually met. So we are so the satellite based approaches are in general uh, pretty effective. Now uh, I'm using AOD as an example, and you can see on this slide AOD and the uh, typical air quality indicator PM 2.5 are different. Right? AOD, uh, as I said before, is a column integrated value. Uh, it's a optical measurement. You can think about it as the optical concentration of ambient particles. Uh, by ambient, I mean it's affected by temperature, by humidity, and so on and so forth. Uh, PM 2.5, on the other hand, it's a lab measure quantity of dry mass concentration for particles with a pretty clearly defined, clearly defined size cut, which is 2.5 micrometers in aerodynamic di the diameter on the ground. Now, how do we make this uh, conversion? Uh, it, it follows a seemingly uh, straightforward relationship, right? Uh, if AOD is satellite measurement and then C is the PM concentration on the ground, as long as you know a few parameters in between, you got a perfect linear association. Now, these parameters represent particle density, extinction coefficient, effective radius, uh, particle vertical distribution, and so on and so forth. So essentially, this PM-AOD relationship is affected or modified by particle composition, particle size, and particle vertical profile. Now, these parameters are really difficult to obtain at a large scale. And that's why this, when we don't have accurate measurements of these parameters, we don't get this deceivingly simple association between the satellite measure and the ground concentration. Right? So what we need to do is, in this case, to mimic this association or to put in surrogates or indicators of these physical parameters to make a robust association. Uh, simply put, let's say uh, at the lower right corner of this schematic, you see air, uh, EPA air monitors, that is the ground observations we have. And they're sparse, they're not evenly distributed. We use them as so-called anchors Right, to characterize or nail this blanket of satellite measurements. 
to help make this transition, we add into the model additional indicators of either sources or transport. For example, we add meteorology, we add traffic data, population, you know, human settlements, we add in land use, land cover parameters, and then we add in this uh, semi-direct uh, measure of particle abundance, which is uh, the satellite AOD, for example. And these parameters are often put into a prediction modeling framework. And the, uh, the prediction model gives you something uh, uh, to the lower left corner of the slide. So you can see the transition from sparse ground observations to a uh, comprehensive estimation of the space-time distribution of PM2.5. That's the idea of developing a satellite-driven PM2.5 exposure model. Uh, so far, there have been many different uh, uh, methodologies proposed in the literature. Uh, from the uh, relatively straightforward, you know, multi-linear regression type of uh, framework proposed about a decade uh, or so ago, to nowadays uh, very sophisticated, you know, Bayesian-based statistical models, uh, fusion models, and machine learning models. Uh, there are a wealth of publications you can find in the literature. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't so far, there hasn't been a one-size-fit-all tool. I mean, that's why it's important, as, as Tracy indicated, that to, to use satellite data in a sophisticated fashion, uh, you need to contact an expert. And typically, uh, the experts are around there to help, and then HACAS being one of them. Okay, uh, kind of my, uh, my uh, last minute, not, not last minute, <laughs> uh, my final thoughts on the use or the utility of satellite models and then kind of where the field is and where the field is moving at this point. So far, um, we have pretty good ideas, pretty good tools to characterize the spatial trend of PM2.5 at, at the urban to global scale. Right? So from as small as a city to as large as the whole world, we know how to measure the time average spatial pattern of PM. At the uh, temporal scale for a given location, we know how to characterize the daily to interannual variability of PM. And these uh, estimated PM exposure has has been used in exposure assessment for health effects study. Um, in recent years, in fact, satellite-driven exposure models have been entering the mainstream of uh, EMR model health effects or, or you know, air pollution health effects assessment. In the near future, or it, I mean, as it's happening now, we will have improved coverage and accuracy from the satellite platforms. Uh, we will be able to study pollution episodes, for example, intense wildfires and dust storms. We have the data, uh, we have the satellite platforms, we are developing uh, statistical tools to deal with this. And we will be able to, in, in the very near future, we will be able to report hourly or even sub-hourly variability of PM and perhaps ozone as well. So at this um, enhanced spatial and temporal resolution, uh, we are moving into uh, more uh, community-driven environmental justice issues. Finally, we have what it takes to do uh, to resolve these sort of uh, uh, concerns. Now for regulation, um, the, the advancement has been uh, slower than the academic side. We have seen satellite data being used as Justification for exceptional events. We have seen uh, satellite data being used in the development and evaluation of emission inventories so that the, uh, the, the uh, uh, atmospheric chemistry models can be improved. We've also seen satellite data being used as tools to evaluate policy efficacy, long term policy efficacy. Um, that's uh, all I have. Thanks. 
Great. Uh, thanks so much, Young, and thanks, Tracy. Really appreciate the information and look forward to the, the Q&A. But ultimately, I think this really is, is exciting. It goes to show that uh, the more accurate, the more usable, and the more information we have uh, can really help to, uh, as you said, on the, the hour, hourly basis uh, would be wonderful uh, to have that kind of really high-level data available to allow for people to take actions as quickly as possible to protect their health and, and respond to these, these big uh, catastrophic events for sure. And on the everyday, um, as you mentioned, with the environmental justice concerns as well. Um, but I do think, you know, as, as these um, products come forward and, and they're more useful, um, I think that uh, they're only going to help boost our understanding and, and ability to react and protect public health. So I, I really do appreciate um, your presentations and the, uh, the conversation here today as a whole. So uh, with that, I'll just end and say thank you again and uh, look forward to taking some questions with the group.